Now, it is also possible to cause evolution of a species without ever changing the gene or changing the way the gene is treated or changing the way the cell responds to the environment or changing whether or not the gene is even activated or cell communication or any of those things we already talked about. Sometimes the species changes not because the gene changes or the way the, gene, the genes are treated changes, but because of another set of genes that we call developmental genes, all right? So it's, sometimes it's not about you know, how you respond or if you respond or even what the gene even is, but about when in your life that gene becomes active, at which point in your life the gene becomes active. Um, so this leads to the to discussion of what we call developmental genes. Now, some animals grow in what we call an isometric pattern. Now, notice, for example, this uh, lizard here on the top right, how he actually grows exactly the same from the small size to the large size. As soon as he's kind of like a little, little baby, he already looks exactly how he's going to look like an adult. The adult is just larger. So that's called isometric. It's pretty much the same everywhere. Now, humans are not like that. We grow uh, completely different. Our proportions change throughout life. Uh, uh, the, even the parts of our body change and develop differently throughout life. It's, that's called allometric um, uh, growth. So what, why, what explains allometric growth is the idea that new structures show up or changes in the dimensions are going to happen because... At different points during the development, different genes will activate. Now, you can already see that when you see the embryonic development and you see that you start from a single zygote, but as the zygote progresses in more and more, you see that at different points, different cells will activate and different cells will, will start activating different genes and it will become different. That's, all the, that's the differentiation that happens in all multicellular organisms. But how each of those cells changes... Uh, and, and when each of those cells changes is going to help determine how the final organism looks like. Now, that leads to the idea of heterochrony. Right? Now, heterochrony is the idea that the timing and the rate of the development helps determine the final look of the organism. So, sometimes two organisms have exactly the same gene. But, because one activates the genes earlier, it's going to look different from the other organism as an adult. Or maybe sometimes one develops faster. Again, that's going to cause changes in the organism as an adult. So two examples of this uh, are going to cause what we call uh, pyetomorphosis, which is retention of traits which are usually juvenile traits, or traits that animals typically have when they're young, in the adult or the sexual mature organism. And that's going to happen for two different reasons. The first reason this happens is because of what we call neot neoteny or neoteny, all right? And that's because the development is slow or delayed. So that means that because uh, you delay development so much, you're going to get to be sexual mature before you even do that developmental step. And so you're not going to look like an adult for that, for that trait, because you never activated those genes soon enough or fast enough so that you would actually have the adult feature before you actually became an adult, at which point you probably stopped developing those genes altogether. Now, see, most organisms in the mammals will have long snouts as, uh, as adults. You see that in the wolf, for example, in the picture there, and most breeds of dogs. But you might notice that poppies have, like, uh, flattened snouts, and they, that's a characteristic of the juvenile mammal. And you notice how monkeys, as they become adults, they have that stretched cranium structure. You see that on the left side over there. But neoteny is causing humans to have a flat head. We don't really have the same cranial structure that the monkeys have. And the reason we, we like that is, is so that we can maximize the cranium size instead of maximizing the jawline size and retain uh, the proportions which will allow the brain uh, size to become larger. Uh, other traits like that is what makes us be able to have a pelvic structure which are also remain erect. Uh, all other traits such as intelligence, like vision, hearing, a lot of the different things that humans do are tied in to changes in developmental genes of humans. So what happens there is that a mutation took place in, in the developmental genes of humans, which slowed down the rate of development of certain genes. And in some cases, even delayed it so much that sexual maturity is reached before those genes activate. But that caused us to be different from the, the other simians and other apes and other monkeys even though we have exactly the same genes so it wasn't exactly the f effect of of having different genes in that case is 
about when those genes became active because of differences in the genes that control how fast or how soon those genes activate. So you see, heterochrony or a change in the timing or the rate of development led us to look juvenile for something traits. Now, that may sound like bad because we have traits from the young, but if those traits allow us to have things like large brain size, that actually gives an advantage, and that's why it was selected for. So that mutation, which messed up the, the, the gene that controls the activation of other genes, was selected for because it allowed for other traits like a large brain size to actually become possible. So in a way, we're juvenile as adults for certain traits compared to the monkeys. The monkeys develop things that we don't develop, but that's good because the development of those things actually impeded the development of other things which actually made us smarter than them and more capable than them. So that is why neoteny is actually seen as an important step in human evolution and actually evolution of a lot of different animals. Notice, for example, how the King Charles Cavalier is, has neoteny because his snout, even as an adult, looks like uh, the snout of, of, a, of a young actual uh, animal. And you see here a perfect example of that. This is a King Charles Cavalier. She's very upset because I'm using her as an example, as you can see. But her snout is actually very, very, very short, like the snout of a little puppy. All right? So that is why uh, her developmental genes ha are mutated and she doesn't uh, actually develop soon enough or fast enough for, her, for by the time she gets to an adult, she hasn't changed her snout yet. Now, another way to reach the same result of looking like a juvenile as an adult, which again is called pyetomorphosis, is to have fast re maturity. In other words, instead of developing the, the traits faster or slower or whatever, you make sure that you reach sexual maturity f sooner. That means that you didn't change the activation of genes. What you changed is the activation of sexual maturity. Yes, that is genes too. But you didn't mess with the development of certain genes. What you did is you brought sexual maturity earlier. That means because you accelerated sexual maturity, the genes that never developed before then never really become part of the, of, of the process. So again, you're going to look like a juvenile. And you see this process here in the... Uh, Salamanders that you see on the right side, some of the salamanders retain features from the early stages of development because they reach sexual maturity before the development of those traits actually um, activated, or you know, so they retain the structures that are common in the actual early stages of the organism. So either by by slowing down the rate of of of, of the activation of certain genes or by delaying the activation of certain genes which is called neoteny or by progenesis which is accelerating sexual maturity you can create a juvenile look in the adult or the sexual mature organism which at times may lead to an advantage to that organism so that's why uh, it became preserved and that in case of humans for example that's why so many different traits are we were possible because of those things all right. Now, in terms of developmental genes, there's another trait that can lead to differential evolution between species that has nothing to do with this. And that's called the segmentation genes or the genes that decide, help us decide where to put different structures in our bodies. Now, uh, larvae from, from birds, from humans, from animals, all across the animal kingdom, there's a set of genes that we call HOX genes and HOX genes and also other genes that are called parahox genes which are a group of genes or a family of genes, which is represented here, which is actually in charge of controlling the position of different uh, things in your body. And the way they work is that when your embryo is developing here on the early stages, different parts of the embryo will activate different Hox genes. So if this part activates a certain group of just genes, that's going to become this part of the body. But if that part activates a different group of genes, that becomes a different part of the body. And that's how different areas of the body know how to look. Because depending in which Hox gene is active or when the Hox gene activates in that area, you're going to have segmentation. So segmentation, which is crucial for the development of animals, evolved because of these Hox genes. Now, the interesting thing is that these genes are highly conserved throughout the evolutionary process. What that means is that Pretty much, it's similar across all animals. Now, of course, there's going to be a little bit of variation here and there, but pretty much, 
the same Hawks jeans that make the antenna into bugs are the that make the antenna into bugs are the Hawks jeans that will make the top of our head be the way it is. So segmentation genes seem to be crucial for the formation of organisms, and that's why they will conserve throughout the, the uh, evolution of animals. And all the change is are actually activating. But segmentation is controlled mostly by them. Now, another example of this is the MADS box in flowers. Now, the MADS box is unique to plant species, although the Hox genes will also be seen in plants that will help create segmentation. Plants also have special genes called MADS genes, especially the flowering plants, which help form the flowers, okay? Now, this is the idea of the ABC model for flower uh, generation. Now, you see the flowers have a lot of different parts. And they have the male organ, the female organ, and the petals on the outside, the sepals. So all of these different parts of the flower have to develop. So how, but how does the flower know uh, where to become as, the, as, as it's growing? How does it know that to make the petals on the uh, sepals on the outside, and then the petals, and then the stamen, and then the carpal? How does it know where to put what? The idea, the idea is that there are different genes to control each of the parts. Now, if you have only gene A active in that area, all right, then you're going to become, you're going to make the, the sepals, which are on the outside. But if you have genes A and B active, then you're going to become maybe the petals, which are in the inner part. Now, if you have genes uh, B and C active, then maybe you become the stamen, which is an inner side. And if you only have genes C active, then maybe you become the carpal, which is in the middle. So depending in which genes are active, you're going to create this uh, shape. So as the flower is developing, different genes will activate in different areas, and the coordination of that will help determine uh, the shape of the flower. So just like the Hox genes help create segmentation, the MADS genes will help create the shape and the structure of the flower. Now remember, if any of these Hox genes or MADS genes were to change, you would change the organism even though the genes which they control did not change. So remember, the Hox and MADS genes help decide which genes are active in which part of the body. But if you were to change any of those genes, you would definitely change the body. So you can cause evolution without changing the genes for that part of the body. All you have to do is change the genes that control if those genes are active. So that is another example of how to cause evolution by messing with, with, with genes. So I hope you understand that evolution that you've been talking about happens at the genetic level. It's controlled by genes. All right?